All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, if you could, please, if you haven't checked your email, uh, please be sure to check the message that I sent out to the class uh, regarding going back to class next week. So, as you probably already know, the university is is going to have us go back on um, about beginning next week at the end of January. So that means that our first day back will be next Wednesday, uh, February 2nd. And the topic identification for the paper is due later that night. So just be aware of that. Uh, the drop box for that is in, is in the block for next week in, in Gaucho space. So the way it's going to work basically is that from now till the end of the uh, quarter, I'll be, we will have the main lecture um, in class on Wednesdays. We will not have it on Mondays. On Mondays, I will record my lectures like I've been doing so far and upload them uh, as video video lectures. The Your sections, this is important too, your sections will remain online. So if you, yeah, so don't worry about having to uh, attend physical sections. As I said, those will uh, remain online. So it will just be Wednesdays then that you will need to come physically to class. And, you know, hopefully, you know, as long as we're all masked and, and vaccinated and, you know, <laughs> practicing good things, um, you know, hopefully we won't turn it into a super spreader event. But again, we need to be very masked and so on. If you have a biohazard suit, feel free to wear it or offer one to your friends. Um, Okay, so this today I'm going to finish up talking about conceptualization and measurement from chapter four. Next week we're going to get into generalizability and sampling. Um, then you are identifying whatever topic you're interested in in terms of research. Then the following week, which will be on Wednesday, you'll have a research question that that will be due. Um, and then the next week you have the research design before you basically turn in the final research paper, uh, proposal on 1159. And again, the instructions for the for those uh, will show up um, next week. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, next week for the research question and the research design. You just have to basically put a word or a sentence in uh, for, for identifying the research topic. One thing I do want to emphasize, though, is that if you know, we, we don't talk about qualitative methods uh, until the last or about the last week of February. And qualitative methods, you know, is something that this department in particular um, specializes in. Um, I've been at Penn State, which is sort of the opposite, where they specialize in very highly quantitative uh, methods. So I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of both. However, so you, several of you may want to propose a qualitative research pro uh, project as opposed to like a survey, which would be quantitative or, you know, quantitative data um, analysis of, of uh, say, census data and, and, and various variables and so on. Um, so you may want to do interviews. You may want to be pro or proposing, I should say. You may propose to do interview. You may propose to do historical research or um, observational research, and so on and so forth. So feel free to you know jump ahead and look at that in the book um, in terms of what a qualitative you know proposal would look like or qualitative research how it looks like. Um, you know, or or contact me or your TAs and anyway we'll get you there. Um, let's see, and then uh, we basically end with chapter 12. We don't go into the analysis part of uh, the textbook because we don't quite get there, but you know, if you're, if you're, if you feel so interested, uh, you feel free to look ahead there. Okay, so I think that's it in terms of, you know, getting us ready for, uh, for next week when we go back to the real world, so to speak. Okay, so last time I ended talking about measurement validity, or just kind of mentioning that that's what we'd be talking about. And I'll get there, but first, before we get there, kind of, I did want to um, kind of emphasize, emphasize a few things from the brief video we watched with Roger Griffin uh, last week and his, his research on fascism. Remember, I'm using authoritarianism and fascism as sort of like the main research topics, kind of like the book kind of revolves primarily around um, race and, and income and so on. So anyway, um, I think 
one of the there's this this groundbreaking book that was written a number of years ago called Ideologies and Political Theory, a conceptual approach, which is why it fits in well with this week. So Frieden develops this, what he calls a conceptual morphological approach, which is a semantic, a semantic approach, which basically means that um, there might be political views within a, a universe of meaning. What does that mean? Um, basically that it's, it's almost like an enclosed state of meaning and um, political views can change how that universe of meaning uh, what it means <laughs> it can it can challenge how we think of, of of things as they're you know traditionally termed and so on Griffin if you remember he was asked how do you study fascists have you been studying fascism for the last uh, few decades and so on and he says that he does this by reading fascist literature by reading what they say and how they view the world according to themselves and that's very important um, rather than just people from the outside looking at fascist movements and describing them you know griffin says you've got to you know at least read their literature and perhaps you know talk to them um, and he calls this methodological empathy, which I thought was kind of a an interesting way to state it. I can say for you know environmental research, for for example, uh, um, some old guys who used to be at the department, uh, Bill Freudenberg, one of the founders of environmental sociology, he passed away a number of years ago, uh, and Harvey Mollich, and he's at NYU now. And I mentioned him with the growth machine last week. Well, they did a number, a bunch of research a number of years ago on oil drilling on around Santa Santa Barbara on the uh, offshore uh, and so on. And Bill Freudenberg, as he was interviewing the oil people from the oil companies and so on, who you know hate environmental regulations and just want sort of free reign with with their drilling and so on, he basically. As someone who was an environmentalist and was opposed to uh, offshore oil drilling, he knew that he wasn't going to get much good data if he went in there sort of being himself and being, you know, confrontational or something like this, or uh, if he was going to be put off by what the what the what the interviewee said. And so he went in there and basically, you know, he kind of sort of agreed with them as they were talking, just kind of like, oh, but rather than saying yes, you are right, he was kind of like, oh, I can see what you mean, and. I've sort of employed that in my own research. I've, you know, interviewed some many, many people, developers in particular, some of whom were I just enjoy talking to, others <laughs> where it was sort of a challenge in terms of uh, just very different moral outlooks in terms of what what development means. Um, but you know, my basic approach was the same way, kind of like get into their universe of meaning, meaning essentially, uh, and look around. And then you might get a better view from trying to look at it from the outside. And that's the extent of space metaphors I can give right now. So this is very important for high, high quality research because they might open up to you in a way that they might not otherwise, but it can be troubling in the sense that you might be sort of like agreeing to stuff that you are really finding, you know, maybe morally repulsive or something like that. So anyway, that's for, for interviewing and um, also for reading, you know, literature, if you're, you know, studying an organization or a movement or something like this. Uh, employing methodological empathy, that's primarily something that we see in uh, qualitative research. Okay, so what is face validity? Face validity is when you basically accept a measure on its face. Uh, that's, you know, you're asked, do you feel the assessment was an adequate, adequate measure of your mathematical ability? And you say, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> and that's uh, what they, what they uh, describe. I mean, what they, what they would put down, the, the researchers. So basically, face validity means that you don't really investigate it further. You don't really critically accept it for the most part. Um, it's accepted, you know, as it is. And you don't always do that in, you know, in sociological research, but it does happen. What we often find, though, is we need, to, for, for better measurements, we want a, we want concurrent validity. And concurrent validity is when you can use two different measures or more, you know, kind of they're examining um, 
or two different measures and you can give them to the same group and then compare the results and it'll give you an idea of you know which scale might be better so here it's got 42 item depression scale stephanie's new depression scale that she made up um and he would test a group and they would take this then he would compare the results and see you know is stephanie's new depression scale a modification of this 42 item depression scale um, I will generally say that 42 items, well, I'll get to that later. Generally, that's a pretty long test, at least for, for, for measurement of depression. But anyway, so as I said, um, you know, we've been kind of talking about fascism, authoritarianism, populism is another word that's sort of in that mix. Um, but these are also very, you know, they're kind of different things. So we talked about the construction of this, um, the F scale, which was this potential for fascism. So if people scored high on it, uh, that meant that they were, you know, likely to be a fascist if, you know, that sort of movement were to uh, take power or come into existence. But they also developed another, uh, a number of other scales and started with this scale on anti-Semitism. They looked at ethnocentrism and political and economic conservatism. And really, for the most part, these three are the ones that are just kind of measuring sort of outward attitudes, you know, exterior attitudes that a person may have, whereas the F scale was supposed to really get into the unconscious and measure that. And remember that it kind of went from this idea of, you know, parents being anxiety, being anxious and uh, having rigid parenting um, rules and so on. The kid identifies with their aggressor and then they project those negative qualities onto other people. Well, as I mentioned, that was published in roughly 1960, and quickly it became clear that there were lots of problems with it, and we'll talk about it more specifically when we get into uh, the chapter on survey survey research. But basically, a lot of questions were just problematic, and they didn't necessarily measure what they were supposed to, kind of that validity uh, thing that I were talking about. And so it was generally... Uh, for like the 60s and 70s, for the most part, it was just generally criticized. Um, and then what you saw was this guy named Bob Altemeyer, a who starts t kind of he takes an interest in in um, the F scale and he wants to modify it, and that's what he does. And he's an interesting fellow. He is a professor uh, at the University of Manitoba in like politics or something. Um, I believe he's retired now, but for like two or three decades, he basically was developing scales of authoritarianism, trying to develop better, stronger measurements. Um, he was, and importantly, he was not doing this with like funding from anywhere. It was just what he was doing in his free time. Um, you know, he would have his, he would test his students, that sort of thing. But he was not getting, you know, not getting tenure for this, not getting money or anything. But we're sort of indebted to him because for a long time he was the only person that was really, you know, trying to develop stronger measures for authoritarianism. So he develops this scale looking at authoritarian attitudes. And what he finds is that they tend to correlate, or at least his measure correlated with conservative attitudes. And that becomes part of the problem with the scale itself, which we'll get into later. But okay, the RWA, so this has been a huge, huge scale, and you'll find that you know, it's been used a lot over the last 20 to 30 years. <clears throat> so as I said, modification F scale, uh, named right wing because of the tighter association with conservatism, does not necessarily mean that all right wing or equals authoritarian or all conservatism uh, equals authoritarianism. However, conservatism does tend to <clears throat> correlate with um, authoritarian measures than uh, liberalism does. Just be aware of that. The scale is problematic, though, because there are clear left-wing biases, which you'll see. Um, nevertheless, it still does provide uh, some useful measures. So you can see the this was just, let's see, mm, last spring, uh, April in 2021. Uh, they looked at about a thousand U.S. adults, pretty good nationally re representative scan sample there. Morning Consult did this poll and they basically, you know, they did the RWA. They sent out the RWA to a, a number of people and looked at it, looked at um, 
looked at the different attitudes. And already you can see some interesting demographic factors in terms of high RWAs, basically even between male and female, not much of a difference. Um, in terms of, you know, kind of the age group, 45 to 64, that right now is one of the largest age groups, not the largest, but um, maybe that's surprising, maybe not. It's hard to say. Ideology tends to be, <clears throat> you know, on the on the left or right, tends to be on the right. Uh, again, that's in line with what the, what the R RWA uh, says. In terms of ethnic group, 85% of har high RWA groups are, RWA people are in, are, are white. Um, be interesting to see see this broken down a little bit more because I've actually seen research that um, would suggest that actually white people aren't the most high w RWA, but anyway, maybe we'll get there. Um, where people live tends to be primarily suburban and rural, kind of interesting there. Uh, education here, I think this is something that we should pay, take, you know, pay close attention to because we are, you know, college educated and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the high RWA groups are in the no college in terms of, um, you know, high, high RWA and a bachelor's degree, only 14%, uh, only 10% per post-grad for high RWA. So anyway, interesting profile, you know, kind of, you can see how a statistical measure sent out to, you know, a nationally representative sample can tell us a lot in terms of basic descriptive research. But in terms of why these things are the way they are, you know, we can only we can only basically speculate based upon, you know, what we know about these various topics. There's another along with that was sent a some questions about do you feel that the U.S. Capitol rioters on January January sixth, twenty twenty one were uh, were they protecting the government or were they undermining the U.S. government? And there was also an option for don't know or no opinion. Now for start with people on the left and low RWA, um, for the most part, they were undermining the U.S. government. Basically, people from 89% and up <laughs> uh, basically felt that way. Small groups didn't know. Um, smaller groups were, you know, thinking that it was protecting the U.S. government. On on the right, though, it's, it's quite different. You see for people just right-leaning adults, not even, uh, say, you know, high RWA. Um, so for right-leaning adults, 46% said undermining the U.S. government, but you did have 34% who said it was uh, protecting. Among people who scored high on the RWA, 52% uh, said it was under undermining the U.S. government, whereas 26% uh, said it was protecting the U.S. government. Now, to some degree, uh, this is not surprising. All I can, let me, yeah, let me see. Uh, the one thing that I would say here is that one reason why might be that higher authoritarian, authoritarianism by itself generally means order, stability, um, you know, following the rules and that kind of, that kind of thing. That's sort of the def definition, being submissive to authority. Um, and the people on January 6th definitely were not submissive to authority. So in this sense, it's perhaps not surprising that you would see people who are higher on the authoritarian scale, um, you know, think that they were undermining the U.S. government more than perhaps, you know, just general right-leaning adults, which is interesting and perhaps frightening, and <laughs> depending on how you're interpreting that data, sort of how I'm interpreting it. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, when they, how did they measure the right, left, and middle ideology? So they used this eight point Likert scale. What's a Likert scale? It's you, those one, those scales that range from like satisfied to uns, like mostly satisfied, completely satisfied, you know, unsatisfied, whatever. All those scales ranging um, from a lower, lower uh, score upward or whatever. Sorry, my brain's not working right at the, right at the moment. Um, so people were grouped into a left ideology if they selected the first three, and a middle if they selected uh, four, and then a right ideology if they selected five to seven. Uh, and that appendix isn't there for you, but if you're interested, I can upload the article where this comes from. So the RWA index was measured using the RWA scale that was utilized by um, Altemeyer.
uh, this was also sent out globally um, and looking at people in a few few rich countries uh, and where they kind of where they kind of ended up and we can take a look at this as right-wing authority ratings for each of the following countries as measured by the Altemeyer scale area shown eight country average and uh, so you can see that you know and then um, you can see the, the the population range down here and so on now in terms of the RWA there are three components to it and this is kind of important for for the theory for testing the theory and also to get us to think about how these theories and how questions are uh, are developed so the first thing is conventionalism uh, second is authoritarian submission uh, and the third is authoritarian aggression oh and I do, before I go any farther, I do want to point out, we do want to make sure that we have reliable measures. Uh, measurement reliability is this way that we can make sure that um, okay, sorry. So uh, a good example of measurement reliability would be the RWA because it tends to yield consistent scores. Um, you may not think it's a valid measure of authoritarian. Maybe it kind of focuses on too much on um, on certain political attitudes, um, but it is reliable in the sense that you know you're going to get you're going to get consistent results, and that's a that's kind of a prerequisite for measurement validity. You can't tell if re research is uh, valid or not until you know that the measures uh, basically that they work, that they are reliable. They're going to you know come across the same thing uh, usually. So I do want to, let's see here, take a look at some of the questions. This will be important for when we, for, whoops, for when we um, talk about survey questions. So you can see here there's uh, openpsychometrics.org, how you can take the right-wing authoritarianism uh, scale. You can see some of the questions. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but you can see but we're gonna we are going to when we when we start talking about questions but for an example you see uh the old-fashioned ways quote unquote and the old-fashioned values still show the best way to live what our country really needs is a strong determined leader who will crush evil and take us back to our true path uh, god's laws about abortion pornography and marriage must be strictly followed before it is too late and those who break them must be strongly punished uh etc etc Anyway, so I took it, and they give you some results, and mine was 23.3%. Higher scores indicate more right-wing authoritarianism, so uh, not not so so high for me. Um, but like I said, you can go and take it and see kind of what these are the questions that are there, and you can kind of take it and see whether you think it's um, it's valid or not. You know, it's as I said, it tends to be pretty reliable, but you know, is the question the question is is it because it, will it rely I mean, <laughs> will it be valid in its measurement uh, of authoritarianism so Altemeyer described conventionalism as this rigid adherence to conventional middle middle class values so for example obedience and respect for authority are the most important virtues that children should learn um, and then also the businessman and the manufacturer are much more important to society than the artist and the professor in the sense that it's emphasizing sort of conventional values basically you need people making stuff and selling stuff more than you need you know people painting and pontificating <laughs> uh, and so on that's at least the the conventional the authoritarian conventional attitude uh, then there's also submission so this is this idea that people are submissive they had taken an uncritical attitude toward idealized uh, moral authorities of the in-group so you know for example young people will sometimes get rebellious ideas but they grow out of them as they get older and settle down science has its place but there are many important things that can never possibly be understood by the human mind uh, again that's not necessarily 
doesn't mean that uh, you can't you can <laughs> that you have to if you're not authoritarian you're not wondering about the the universe or anything like that. But basically, the way Altemeyer at least had constructed it, it was this basic acceptance um, of <clears throat> of authorities, and he kind of later on kind of brought in the definition to include the in group, although it kind of it kind of contradicted some of the, his earlier descriptions. And I'll, as we move forward, we'll talk about um, some modifications that have been made to the measurements of authoritarianism. Okay, last one of his three, aggression. So a tendency to be on the lookout for and to condemn, reject, and punish people who violate conventional values. So basically, you know, they would say sex crimes such as rapes or pedophilia should uh, deserve more than just mere imprisonment. You know, uh, such criminals ought to be publicly whipped or worse. So, you know, very aggressive authoritarian attitudes about how uh, crime should be handled. People would talk less and work more. Everybody would be better off. So, you know, these are the types of <clears throat> aggressive attitudes that Altemeyer had had seen as as. Uh, being part of authoritarianism, at least his model, as, as it was developed. So as I said there, that morning consult did that poll last summer. Um, they also found something that here shouldn't necessarily, well, the, the finding should probably be different if Altemeyer's scale, uh, if it's valid. So it finds that, okay, right-leaning high RWA Americans less, less likely to say masks vaccine are effective against COVID-19. So here you say, you know, masks are a necessary step to uh, stop the spread of COVID-19. You see the biggest disagreement are coming from people on the right, much more so than those who are, you know, scoring low on the RWA or are left-leaning. And those that are, for the most part, most people agree, though. I think that's, you know, that's the big takeaway here. But about a third of the population of RWAs and of right-leaning adults disagree. And they say that, you know, they don't want to be forced to wear masks. Uh, same thing with vaccine, just to a lesser lesser extent, probably because you can see vaccines actually work, whereas masks are, um, you know, <laughs> you can't necessarily see it quite as, uh, quite as clearly. Um, now, the one thing that I did want to point out here, too, is that now this is problematic, though, because the one of the things about RWA is that authoritarianism, you basically should be submitting to authority. And uh, the authorities are saying, you know, you need to wear masks and, you know, get in, get your vaccine and act this way and so on and so forth. And yet, you know, a third of the RWAs and right-leaning adults are opposed uh, to that or they don't, they don't believe it. So it's kind of a problem in the sense of being authoritarian because the definition of authoritarian is really submitting to authority is a big, is, is a big part of it. They're not. They don't seem to be submitting to authority, or at least they have a different. They may have have different authorities. They may view their uh, radio stations or podcasters as being more authoritative and having more authority than uh, the CDC, the World Health Organization, the American governments, and so on. Um, so, but again, this is. It tells us something, but it kind of raises more questions about about this measure of RWA and, you know, if, if we can't come up with something perhaps, you know, stronger than, than that. Well, um, Karen Stenner did about 15 years ago and she was interested in, in authoritarianism as well. And she wanted to, she basically kind of thought that, recognized that there was this predisposition to seek out in-group authority, um, uniformity and conformity. So, you know, people aren't maybe thinking the WHO or the CDC as their in-group as much as, say, their, you know, favorite podcaster or favorite radio host or whatever it might be. So she finds that, you know, basically during times of, you know, where there isn't a lot of social strife, people become more relaxed. They may even hold, you know, quote unquote, liberal views. Um, however, when there are conditions of social insecurity and when you have norm conflict, which has been quite the, 
uh, you know, the descriptor of the last few years, then the authoritarian attitudes become activated, they become uh, more, uh, more intense, and so on. And then you see this political, moral, and racial intolerance. What Stenner did, how she did, I should back up a little bit. So, <clears throat> as I said, there have been a lot of criticisms of the, of the F scale. And then uh, my kind of unique, eccentric uh, Canadian professor was just cranking out these research uh, reports on his own research uh, right-wing authoritarian scale, which, you know, has been kind of picked up over the last uh, few years because people have become very interested in this topic of authoritarianism. And so Stinner had all, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was kind of interested in uh, what Altemeyer was doing. Though she pointed out, too, that there's a problem, though. It seemed to, you know, kind of when we looked at those questions, she saw kind of a, a bunch of problem because there was a clear bias there. And so she wanted to be able to be um, examine authoritarian attitudes without linking them to political attitudes. So, you know, beyond whether someone was conservative or, you know, believed in uh, conservative values or whether they were liberal or, or not, she wanted to kind of leave, take that out of the equation and see See if you could tell whether someone was authoritarian, you know, once you remove those. And so what she did, she developed this child trait scale. Her and others, uh, it's been kind of redesigned, but for the most part, <clears throat> they were developing it, kind of thinking of authoritarianism mainly as a wish for order. And so basically, this, they would ask this question, do you think, you know, children should be raised valuing, you know, independence or respect for elders, being obedient or self-reliance, being considerate or well-behaved, being curious or having good manners. And the w ones that are underlined were basically the ones that, you know, if you checked enough of those, then uh, you would high score higher on the, the authoritarian scale. And so this was actually quite, quite fascinating because it, it did actually, you were able to, um, you know, pull the pull the subjects away from their political ideologies and just look at it on terms of you know how they might think about raising children, and then you know when you bring back in the political attitude, we still find that authoritarianism um, correlates with more with conservatism than liberalism, which makes sense. You know, conservatism at its core is about tradition, about uh, order and um, social order and so on, whereas liberalism is about change and openness and uh, things like that. So a slight, um, slight correlation more with uh, conservatism, but not, you know, not a huge one. And well, we'll keep going. Uh, so basically, other things, content validity, you want to make sure that the concept measure the full range of its uh, meaning. One of the problems with the RWA is that it doesn't really look at authoritarianism outside of the political uh, dynamic, whereas um, Stenners did, um, and the original authoritarian personality did as well. It's just, it just was a bit too nebulous and uh, big. Um, so anyway, that's concept via validity. Then you also want to have con construct valid validity. Um, this is basically when you develop a measure and it's related to other measures as specified in a theory. So you know this is all on the same sort of track coming from Adorno's work on the authoritarian on authoritarianism um, through Altemeyer and Stenner and so on. So it's all co sort of connected by uh, these theories. There are ever, several shorter methods. One of the problems with Altemeyer's scale is that I think there's like oh, there's something like 30 or 40 questions on there. And uh, which, you know, doesn't sound like too many, but, you know, I, I just took it and I was kind of like, okay, all right, let's, let's, let's pick up the pace. So you often see that researchers are trying to, you know, if they trying to write really good survey questions because they want to reduce uh, the number of items because it's known that people, you know, if they get to be too long, people start to lose interest and they start just, you know, not reading as clo closely, you know, just kind of checking off boxes and so on. That can, you know, kind of skew the results and uh, and so on. So the, there's some researchers who, you know, 
develop their own scale. This uh, is it here? No, this it's kind of it's related to this authoritarian child uh, rearing scale. And so they developed it, and they found that first, first of all, that the, a lot of these scales here, the ones up there, the SCA, the social conformity versus autonomy, the group authoritarian scale, the eighteen item aggression submission conventionalism scale, etc. Found that you know the SCA, ACS, and AS all have shown strong correlations with RWA scale. So again. Um, they could be seen as validated as alternatives to it. So if you don't want to give them the RWA, you're kind of worried about some of the things that might be problematic there. You still have a couple other uh, chances of these other scales to, to look for. So with the exception of the ACRV, which ACRV was the aggression submission conventionalism scale. Wait, no, I'm sorry, the authoritarian child rearing value scale. Um, all the measures are too long. So again, the, the child rearing scales are ho also shorter. And, and again, so you can see that they're advantageous in that they pull it out of the book Political Ideology and they're shorter as well. So they can get data and get it quickly. <laughs> so um, Duckett is a major name in, in this field of research. He and uh, this colleague Bismuth, Bismuth, developed a six item very, they called it the very short authoritarian scale. And it, it correlates with RWA. And they decided to, you know, they didn't want to just do it once and say, hey, look, it correlates with RWA. We, you've achieved a uh, perfect, perfect scale here. Um, they did the first test on college students at, I think, a couple of different campuses, and their predictions were confirmed. Uh, then they tested it in the U.S. and the U.K. at uh, different places around there, um, and then they and they found that it, um, pre their confirms were uh, predicted, that it measured RWA, and then they, they compared it with the RWA, the ACS, and the ACRV. Okay, and so, and it basically showed them that, that, that this was basically a, a useful scale, that they could probably start using this VSA scale um, instead of the longer, uh, you know, 30-some item RWA scale. Okay, so today, as I said, we're getting out, getting out uh, fairly early uh, so that you can have you know, time to kind of dig into this and do the reading for this week. I know that it's, we're getting into more, more technical material. So, so yes, on Wednesdays, you know, if you have questions about that, I, I guess you can ask me then, um, or you can send me an email, you can ask the TAs, uh, you can raise it on Packback. And I do want to say that uh, you're doing a fantastic job with Packback. Packback is known for, well, I should say methods classes are known for not being, you know, scoring highly on Packback, or at least not having the most interesting discussions. But uh, this class has very interesting discussions, and I, you know, commend you on that. So keep up the good work there. And I will upload instructions regarding the paper this week. Um, on Monday, my lecture will be uploaded, the first lecture on the sampling. Um, and on Wednesday, then, we will meet in the classroom. Uh, and so I will just wait and see all your masked faces then. All right, have a good weekend.